Well, oh god, I think I just lost the entire article. Hi there, everybody. Trek coaches Adam Cleary. Come in, take a seat, sit down, sit down, shoes off the carpet, etc. Right, so there are nearly six. 100 hours of Star Trek content across movies and television for you to enjoy. Now that might seem like a very random stat to start an article with, but 600 hours for one particular franchise means that there are tens if not hundreds of thousands of hours that have gone into making that. All that time going into the writing, the filming, the producing, the editing, the directing, every single bit of it. How many people must that have involved? And yet, throughout its entire history, only a handful of them have ever been fired. I mean, it does make sense when you think about it. For a show that can be such a star-making gig with such a reliance on returning characters, nobody's going to really want to lose somebody if they can help it. But still, even with that context, compared to the revolving door policy some shows feel like they've got, The Walking Dead, Star Trek just isn't. Hasn't. Doesn't. And that does of course mean that on the rare occasion somebody is fired, the stories behind them tend to be as bizarre and strange and magical and wonderful as the sci-fi episodes themselves. So, since you're all sitting here and I've got nothing else to do for the next ten or so minutes, my name is Adam Cleary and these are seven Star Trek actors who were fired. I just quickly before I start, should probably point out, I wrote an article of this which was 2,000 words but it got deleted so I had to start again. Then I recorded the whole video of this which was really long but it got deleted so this is me doing it again. So just to let you know, this is some cursed content in my opinion so please enjoy it. And just a quick pit stop before we actually begin in earnest to clear up a few names who you might think should be on this list but aren't for technicality reasons. First up, Terry Farrell. She played Jadzia Dax in Deep Space Nine. She wasn't fired. She just approached the producers, asked for more time off to pursue other acting opportunities. They said, no, you can either take what you're offered or you can leave. So she left. Denise Cosby's time as Tasha Yar in The Next Generation was cut short after just 22 episodes, but again, that was her choice. She was frustrated with the lack of character development, so she made demands on the producers, and they said, no, you're not, you're not going to get more screen time, so she walked. And finally, her Next Generation colleague, Marina Sirtis, was nearly fired when she had the audacity to try and ask for some pay parity ahead of filming Star Trek Nemesis. The studio went, nah, if you won't do it for this money, we'll just get Jerry Ryan in from Star Trek Voyager and replace you, and Sirtis went, well, go on then, but you're not going to get Jerry Ryan in for that money either. And she was right, so she stayed. Number 7, Grace Lee Whitney. When Gene Roddenberry first devised the crew for Star Trek, or technically when he second devised the crew for Star Trek, anyway, more on that later, he created the character of Yeoman Janice Rand. Now, she was supposed to be like an assistant of sorts to James T. Kirk, but she was let go before the end of the first season. And by let go, I mean fired. Now, the network and the producers claimed at the time that this was purely budgetary, they were trying to streamline the show to make sure it got a second season, but then Whitney revealed years later that she'd actually been sexually assaulted by somebody on the show and was then quietly let go to try and avoid the negative press. Now, there is a happy ending of sorts to this because an extensive fan letter writing campaign and indeed support from her colleagues on the show got her brought back in time for the movie. She was in the motion picture and the search for Spock and the voyage home and then transferred to the Excelsior with Sulu for the undiscovered country. Now, while she's never gone and named the executive involved in all this because it is her story and not his, this remains a black mark in Star Trek's history. Number six, Jennifer Lien. Now, it's virtually impossible to talk about Kess leaving Star Trek Voyager without using some arrangement of the words nine, seven, and of, given that her last episode was the one right after they formally introduced her new Borg colleague. But the thing is, it's not as simple as that. In a version of events that is backed up by the directors, the producers, even Jennifer Lien herself, it was just that Kess's time on the ship had naturally sort of come to an end. They were really running out of ideas for her, things for her to do. Her character arc felt that it had sort of naturally completed itself and being told they needed to get rid of a character in order to bring another one in, she was just the most natural creative choice. And by letting Kess go, they basically removed the headache of having to write material for a character they had lost their way with while stopping the network getting on their back for overloading a show that, in their opinion, already had too many characters. It's a shame because I really liked Kess, I thought she was a good character, but what was she gonna do? And yeah, she did briefly return for one episode, which kind of just about finished her whole story, but once they decided to bring in a brand new character, that was her straight out of the airlock. Number five, Biff Yeager. I just want to take a quick moment to reflect on what an awesome name Biff Yeager actually is.
All right, that's enough. It's actually a testament to LeVar Burton's performance as chief engineer, Geordie LaForge, that a lot of people forget he was originally the ship's helmsman, while he was manning the con all the way down on deck 36. Yes, I am that kind of a nerd. There was a revolving door of chief engineers all tasked with manning the engines. Now, most of these figures, like her and him, don't stick particularly long in the mind, but one who did was Lieutenant Commander Argyle, who was proving so popular with the fans that the producers considered, in season two, giving him a full-time role on the show, until one day, they just changed their minds, mysteriously. Now, the story here, according to your pal and mine, Will Wheaton, was that the show's producers received a deluge of letters from fans saying how much they liked Argyle and lobbying for a greater role for him, and they were really impressed by the impact he'd made, so they actually considered doing it, until they noticed that some of the letters were referencing things he'd done in episodes that hadn't actually aired yet. So after doing a bit of digging, they discovered that Jaeger himself was behind this. He had apparently been writing to fans personally to pressure them into writing to Paramount to say how much they liked his character. So that was it, him gone pretty much straight away. They replaced him with some of the other engineers and finally made Geordi the full-time person in that role in like, season two. Still though, he did have a good run on Gilmore Girls, so what are you gonna do? Number four, Genevieve Bougeau. Now, it is a common misconception that Kate Mulgrew was the first female captain in Star Trek history. It's not true, of course, it does a massive disservice to all the women who were captains of other ships, just either not named or not credited and certainly didn't have their own series. But the point I'm trying to get at here is not only was she not the first female captain in Star Trek, she wasn't even the first Captain Janeway. Now, when Paramount signed off on having a female-led Star Trek series, the only person they wanted in that role was legendary Canadian actress Genevieve Bougeau. Sorry about the pronunciation if you're watching. She had an extensive, critically acclaimed history of roles in movies, but the problem with this was, while it meant she was a good actress, it meant that she was not in any way prepared for the rigors of intensive TV filming. The long, sometimes 18 hour days on set, the constant changes to the writing, to the script being fiddled with all the time by hair and makeup and wardrobe, even having to work with directors she didn't really know, all did not sit well with her, took its toll, and she left after just a day and a half on set. Yes, on only her second day filming, she headed back to her trailer in tears. She was followed by the producers. A short conversation took place in which it was agreed that things would be better for everybody if she just did not come back to the show. And they recast the part of Nicole Janeway to Catherine Janeway with Kate Mulgrew. So technically, technically she might have walked here, but if she didn't, that push was coming. Number three, Gates McFadden. Yes, they actually fired Beverly Crusher. She didn't really go and take a job as the head of Starfleet Medical. <gasps> Interestingly, the actual truth of this story has only really come out in the last few years, because when she left the show, Paramount issued a statement saying she had left to pursue other career options, when in reality, she just had a phone call from her agent saying, actually, they just want to go in another direction. But the plot thickened substantially when Rick Berman spoke on a panel or a podcast or something I don't remember and said that writer Maurice Hurley really had a bone to pick with her as an actress. He hated the way she did all of her scenes, so he used his considerable sway to have her removed from the show. And if you think that's maybe a little bit convenient, literally the day Maurice left the show as a writer, they got Gates McFadden back. Now that return was probably just inevitable, really, because fans hadn't really reacted to Dr. Pulaski all that well. There was a strong letter writing campaign, a real one this time, wanting her to come back. And even Patrick Stewart thought it was a dumb decision, which now in hindsight, just seems really idiotic. Maurice May, you plum. Number two, Kirstie Alley. Now at the time, the inclusion of Kirstie Alley looked like a transparent and expensive attempt to add some much needed star power to a long running franchise movie and it was, but what people don't realise is that Kirstie Alley was actually a lifelong Star Trek fan who'd run around everywhere as a little girl with a pair of fake Vulcan ears on pretending to be Spock's daughter. So when the part came up for a young Vulcan, she absolutely flew down its throat. She was great in the role, she was a hit with the fans, it was absolutely perfect, but then Star Trek 3 rolled around and she just got randomly replaced with Robin Curtis and nobody seems to know why. And the truth of that is, of course, well, it differs depending on whose version of events you want to believe, but the short version is, 
money. Now the official line from Paramount was when they approached her to reprise the role, her representatives asked for 10 times the fee she'd originally been given, which would have put her ahead of stars like DeForest Kelly. And they were like, well, look, we like you, but you're just not worth that kind of money. And Ali's version of this is that while, yes, they did approach her about reprising the role, they came to her with a bigger part for Star Trek 3, but less money than she'd got in Star Trek 2, so she concluded they weren't actually that interested in having her and decided to walk away from the franchise. Now, where do you think the truth of that is? Because my guess is the middle. Number one, the entire cast of the original pilot minus Spock. And <laughs> you see, see what I've done there? I've gone back to that point I made about it being the second time, which I did in the first entry, revisiting that at the end now, so it's kept you the whole way. Good, good interconnected list writing that. Get on my level. In 1964, with America still firmly gripping just the veiny, throbbing erection it had over the space race, NBC decided to cash in on this by commissioning a show that would deal with man's wondrous voyage into the stars. It was called Star Trek, and it was written, produced, piloted everything by 1965, and they fucking hated it. It was too slow, it was too intellectual, it was too ponderous, it was too scientific, it was too boring, it was not the action adventure that millions of Americans were imagining the final frontier to be. So they decided not to pick up the option on the show. However, in a move that hardly never happens, they were still sold on the premise and they were still sold on Gene Roddenberry as a creator, so they said, Go do another one. Out went Captain Pike, out went number one, out went Dr. Boyce, and in to replace them came the more action-oriented characters of Kirk and Sulu and Scotty. They did keep Spock, but they gave him a whole new character where his emotions were suppressed and invented the whole concept of Vulcans. Now, yes, Pike did stay part of the canon. He reprised his role a few episodes later, and more on that next year, I'm sure, and a few of the faces were recast into other roles, but that was it. Star Trek's most brutal swing of the axe came before it even started. So there you have it. Those are seven actors who were fired by Star Trek, read to you by a man who's going to fire himself if anything untoward happens to this recording of this video. Let me know what you made of it all in the comments below. Of course, forget to like, share, and subscribe if we premiered this. I'm assuming we did. Then thank you so much for joining us. We're really enjoying this whole Trek culture adventure. So join us for a whole host more of it. You can get me on Twitter at Adam Cleary, Trek culture on Twitter at Trek Culture, our wonderful editor Chris at Edit Chris Edit. But in the meantime, that's all for now. We'll see you soon. I need a Star Trek y sign off somehow in the comments. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.